And now we come to the portion of our service where we ask the Holy Spirit to, to fall on us, to move, to shape us and prepare us to receive his word this morning. And we'll close this time by reciting uh, a little bit from Psalm 19, which is printed here in our bulletin. So let's pray. Holy Spirit, breath of God, we ask that you would fall on us this morning. In the same way that the disciples gathered in the upper room in a mixture of anticipation and um, probably a little fear, a little trepidation because they weren't sure what you were going to do next. And then you showed up and you settled on them and you empowered them to go and speak your word. Frankly, Holy Spirit, we are asking for nothing less. Come and move in us. Move us to hear your word, to, to have open hearts and minds to grapple with it, and, and open mouths to be able to share that with whomever you give us the opportunity. If there's anything merely human in this time, Lord, we ask that that would be forgotten and only that which is eternal, which is from you, would remain and uh, shape us to be more and more like Jesus. And so, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. Now, uh, we have a number of visitors today, and so I, I need to tell you a little bit of my background. I was not raised in an agricultural community. I was raised in suburbia outside of a military base. Uh, my dad uh, was not a really avid outdoorsman. Story, long story short, he did not teach me to fish. I, I just... It's not that I don't have that gene. The few times I have gone, I've enjoyed it, but I don't have a lot of fish stories. But I do have one. So I'm going to tell you my one fish story. This is when uh, I was in Centralia, and uh, a number of the guys in that church were very concerned that I didn't know how to fish, and they wanted to make sure that they rectified that flaw in my character. So uh, my buddy James gets... Uh, a bunch of gear together. He, he drives me out to the lake where we're going to fish. He explains what we're going to do the whole time there. I'm an avid student. I'm listening carefully for him. He, um, I mean, it's like I'm a little kid. He helps me bait the hook and everything. I lead way back. I cast, and it's a beautiful, long, gorgeous arc that goes way out into the lake. And he's like, good job. I, I really felt like he was trying to channel a dad. Good job, Ed. And then, sure enough, I felt a tug, and I think I might have some. Well, reel it in. See what it is. And he's fishing away like crazy. And he's, he's working it. He's doing this the whole time. And he caught a fish. And then I finally caught my fish. And he was glad that I caught a fish. He was mad that it was bigger than his. <laughs> and you know... That's the thing about fish stories. They often tell us more about the person doing the fishing than they do about the fish. We're going to see something like that in today's book. We're going to be in the book of Jonah today, which is on page 1436 in your church Bible. We're going to be looking at four major doctrines that we see out of this particular book. I've been doing a series going through each one of the minor prophets and looking at major teachings that often we find in the New Testament or way back in the earlier part of of uh, the Old Testament, looking at major doctrines that we find in these minor prophets. Today, we'll look at four of them. So I'm going to read Jonah chapter 1, verses 1 through 9, to get us started. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa, where he found a ship bound for that port, and after paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. Then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea, and such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. All the sailors were afraid, and each cried out to his own god, and they threw the cargo into the sea to lighten the ship. But Jonah had gone below deck, where he lay down and fell into a deep sleep. The captain went to him and said, How can you sleep? Get up and call on your God. Maybe he will take notice of us and we will not perish. Then the sailors said to each other, Come, let us cast lots to find out who is responsible for this calamity. They cast lots and the lot fell to Jonah. 
So they asked him, tell us who's responsible for making all the trouble for us. What did you do? Where do you come from? What is your country? From what people are you? He answered, I am a Hebrew, and I worship the Lord, the God of the heaven, who made the sea and the land. So our first major doctrine that we see this morning in the book of Jonah is that God is everywhere. God is everywhere. Now, notice the phrase, the Lord, in the Bible, L-O-R-D, all capital letters, in verses 1 and 3 and 4 and 9. This is God's name. Whenever you see Lord spelled out like that in the Old Testament, it refers to the name Yahweh. When referred to by name in the Old Testament, there's often a comparison with other little g gods, like in verse 5. The surrounding nations understood their gods to be geographically limited. Little g gods were local. You'd have a god of the hills or a god of the seashore or a god of the plains or a god of Egypt or a god of the Philistines. The idea that there was one God who made absolutely everything, including all of the other little G gods, wasn't a widely accepted understanding, except the Hebrews got that. The Hebrews knew that part. So how does Jonah correct the assumption of the sailors that, well, which God is responsible and who is he? You know, that, that phrase that they said, so they asked him, tell us who is responsible for making all of this trouble for us. They are, at that point, they are specifically asking for the name of the God so that they can call on that's God's name. And then they ask him, well, what did you do? What did you do to tick your God off so much that he's going to kill all of us? We're innocent. We didn't do anything. And see, that's got to be the thing that would terrify these sailors. They realize that they are stuck on some other God's sea, and they don't know him by name. They don't know how to worship him correctly, and they're really concerned. If we don't get this right, we're all going to die. So what does Jonah do? He tells them in verse 12, pick me up and throw me into the sea, and it will become calm. I know that it is my fault that this great storm has come upon you. And in verse 15, that's exactly what they do. They pitch him overboard. And the storm immediately goes calm. So what do you suppose that teaches the sailors? That Yahweh is the God of heaven and the earth and the sea. And that he's powerful and he should be worshipped. And they're not wrong. As we've been reading through each one of these minor prophets, we've had a little moment in each one where I've tried to make sure that we understand some of the lessons that are in each book. Sometimes I've called them prompts, or I've called them simple truths, or serious moments, but this is Jonah. It's a fish story. What else am I going to call this but a hook? So, the first hook that I want to make sure that we get is to look around for God's sightings. If God is, in fact, everywhere, notice him. What is God doing around us? He is at work. Find him. Our 22nd major doctrine that we find in Jonah is found in chapter 2, verses 1 through 9. And before I read this, remember, when Jonah is tossed overboard, he ends up swallowed by a big fish. Spends three days and nights in the belly of that creature. We read, from the inside of the fish, Jonah prayed to the Lord his God. He said, in my distress, I called to the Lord and he answered me. From the depths of the grave, I called for help, and you listened to my cry. You hurled me into the deep, into the very heart of the seas, and the currents swirled about me. All of your waves and breakers swept over me. I said, I have been banished for, from your sight, yet I will again look toward your holy temple. The engulfing waters threatened me. The deep surrounded me. This next phrase cracks me up every time. Seaweed was wrapped around my head. To the roots of the mountains I sank down. To the earth beneath barred me in forever. But you brought my life up out of the pit, O Lord my God. When my life was ebbing away, I remembered you, Lord, and my prayer rose to you, to your holy temple. Those who cling to worthless idols forfeit the grace that could be theirs. But I, with a song of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you what I have vowed 
I will make good. Salvation comes from the Lord. So our second major doctrine that we see in this book is that divine action prompts thanksgiving. Divine action prompts thanksgiving. As I'm reading Jonah's prayer inside that big fish belly, I'm struck by its resemblance to a typical thanksgiving psalm. And there are thanksgiving psalms all through the books of the psalms. Here's a few words from two of my favorites. Psalm 95. Let us sing songs of praise. Oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. Or Psalm 100, a psalm of giving thanks. Make a joyful noise to all the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and bless his name. In Jonah's prayer, in the middle of the fish, there's this petition for deliverance from verse 2. I called for help and you answered me. There's a review of the crisis that he's in, verses 3 through 6. I have been banished. The engulfing waters have threatened me. The deep surrounded me. The earth barred me in forever. And then Jonah trusts that God is going to deliver him, verses 6 and 7. But you brought my life. Notice that. He is in the middle of the fish praying this prayer. And he has the guts to pray this in past tense. You brought my life up from the pit, Lord. I remembered you and my prayer rose to you to your holy temple. And then there's praise for the rescue in verse 9. But I, with a song of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you. Now he switched to a future tense. Salvation comes from the Lord. And now he's in present tense. Apparently, he was in a tense situation. <laughs> Thank you. Now let me ask you, why would it be helpful to know Jonah's belly psalm? Frankly, it gives us a model to use when giving thanks, when we find ourselves in difficulty, don't we cry out to God, Lord, if you would just, and then we go over whatever that difficulty is that we're praying about, and then we look for God's help. How are you going to step in here, Lord, we pray. And when he does, go over that deliverance. Say a prayer. Not just, Lord, thank you, but thank you because this is where I was, and this is where you stepped in, and this is where you helped me. Give him all the praise and glory for it. There is power in praise. The, the Psalms say that God inhabits the praise of his people. And if God can meet Jonah in this particular circumstance, he can certainly meet us in ours. And so the hook for this section is when we're squeezed, give thanks to God. Our 23rd major doctrine is that God's redemption is for all people. God's redemption is for all people. We're going to see this in Jonah chapter 3. Jonah gets spit up on the shore, and this time he heads straight for Nineveh. He, he has learned his lesson, and he preaches the word of the Lord, and the people of Nineveh actually listen. The message of repentance makes its way all the way to the king. Listen to chapter 3, verses 7 and 8. This is the king's response. Then he issued a proclamation in Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles. Do not let any man or beast, herd or flock, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink, but let man and beast be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. In these two verses in chapter 3, this pagan king, and technically he's not really a king king, he's a magistrate or governor, that's what the original word means. He gives us a wonderful summation of the process of change that accompanies redemption. Let's look at four stages that we can see in this process. And the first is to stop the old life. If you find yourself stuck and you need God's help, stop the old life. If we're going to change our ways, if we're going to change the way we think about doing things, we have to give up the old stuff. The second is to prepare to meet God. When we turn towards God, we are stepping into brand new territory. His 
territory. And since God is in control of all of it, here's what we can focus on. That the idea that God is local, well, man, I, I don't know if I can come to your church. I have invited people to come to church, and they have said this silly statement, oh, if I came to church, the ground would open up and swallow me whole. And like, Do you think that my God is so small that he only lives in this building? No. My God invented the oxygen you're breathing and continues to supply it to you. You can come. It's safe. God is not local. God is everywhere. So come and face him. This third step is prayer. This is how we face God. Interact with God as you find him in this new place that you end up in. And then fourth is repentance. Now, repentance in the New Testament, the word is metanoia. It means to think in a new way. Is when, if you begin to think differently, you take necessary steps to continue to think in that new way. I'm not going to go back to my old ways. I'm not going to do that old thing. Let me give you a hint. If I tell you, don't think of a red barn, that doesn't work. So if you want to repent, if you want to think in a new way, you can't just attach a negative to your old way of thinking and think that is sufficient for repentance. Well, I know I struggle with these kinds of thoughts, and so I'm not going to think those thoughts anymore. Well, as soon as you say the, the words, as soon as you think the thought, I'm not going to think those thoughts, you have, in fact, thought those thoughts. You have to replace them. You have to find something new to think about. Personally, I've tried to develop a habit of memorizing scripture that goes along with whatever that new life is that I'm trying to live in. I have hidden your word that I might not sin against you, Psalm 119, verse 11. Uh, in the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus, Romans 6, 11. I found those things to be very effective strategies to change the way I think about an old part of my life that I want to leave behind. Let's look closely at chapter 3, verse 10, for just a moment. And God saw their works, the works of the Ninevites, that they turned from their evil way, and God was compassionate over the evil that he had declared to do to them, and he did not do it. Now, God, who knows our hearts, sees two things in the people of Nineveh that move him to compassion. Number one, they listen to the warning that God gave. And number two, they turn from their old ways. And that gives us our third hook, take needed steps towards God. Finally, our last major doctrine for today, number 24, we find in chapter 4 of Jonah. And in this chapter, we see a very angry prophet. Understand that the Ninevites were considered to be ruthless in how they dealt with their captured foes. And I'm going to deal with this in a more detail two weeks from now when we get to Nahum. Commercial. I don't think Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh because he didn't want to give the word of the Lord. I think he didn't want to go because he knew God's forbearance and compassion and he didn't want Nineveh to receive them. He didn't want Nineveh to be pardoned. Jonah goes, he preaches the command to repent and the city repents. And when the Lord decides that he is not going to punish the city, Jonah responds in anger. I knew you were going to forgive those no good so-and-sos. I just... The Bible says that he's furious with God because God was compassionate. He didn't want the Ninevites to be forgiven. He wanted the Ninevites nuked from orbit. And when God forgives, he's mad. But the Lord replied in verse, verses 4 through 11, Have you any right to be angry? Jonah went out and sat down at a place east of the city, and there he made himself a shelter, and he sat in the shade and white, waited to see what would happen to the city. Okay, Lord, fire, come on, let's see it. Brimstone, big meteorites, big pointy rocks from the sky. Let's, however, let him have it. And God doesn't let him have it, and he's mad. Then the Lord provided a vine and made it grow up over Jonah to give shade for his head, to ease his discomfort. And Jonah was very happy about the vine. Verse 7, But at dawn the next day, God provided a worm which chewed the vine so that it withered. And when the sun rose, 
God provided a scorching east wind, and the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. He wanted to die and said, It would be better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, Do you have any right to be angry about the vine? I do, he said. I'm angry enough to die. But the Lord said, You have been concerned about this vine. Although you did not tend it and you did not make it grow, it sprang up overnight and it died overnight. But Nineveh has more than 120,000 souls who do not know their right hand from their left and cattle besides. Should I not be concerned about that city? So our last major doctrine, number 24, is that God's compassion overrides anger. God's compassion overrides anger. In verse 4, the Lord asked this probing question, have you any right to be angry? A great question. We should ask ourselves this question when we're about to lose our temper. When somebody cuts us off on the road or doesn't treat us well when we're out in public or whatever it is. What is it that makes us angry about things that we are not in control of? I think we might have a hint in verse 10 which tells us about our human tendencies. God lets Jonah know that he's been concerned about this vine, although he didn't tend it or work for it. I think perhaps a problem is that we often want to assume ownership over God's actions. Perhaps it's a way of fooling ourselves into thinking that we have more control over the universe than is actually true. And what does verse 11 show us about our human values as we're wanting to run everything to our own satisfaction. God says, but Nineveh has more than 120,000 souls who can't tell their right hand from their left. Great phrase. And many cattle as well. Shouldn't I be concerned about that great city? We frequently focus on our own concerns instead of the Lord's, yes? And so for our final hook for this morning is that we are the demonstration of God's compassion for broken people. You're broken. I am broken, shattered. And yet God meets us in our brokenness. You know, it's kind of funny. I pray every single week that God would shape us to be like Jesus, that he would kind of, and the image in my mind is that we take the sharp edges off. And I'm realizing that I think maybe a more accurate picture is that of a mosaic. God takes all of our broken little pieces and arranges them just so. So when you step back and you squint, well, there's Jesus right there. You are the picture of Jesus to a broken world. And God can take their pieces and put them right into the picture too. That's what we're praying for. We are the demonstration of God's compassion for broken people. God's heart is moved for the lost. He loves them so much that he became one of us so that he could show us all the way of reconciliation. It's easy to love God in response to his work after we have been brought to life. Once alive, we can see that God has loved us all along in order to love others. But what about those who are still dead in their sin? Part of our loving God is showing them that God has brought the joy of eternity into our lives, and that he wants to do the same for them. So here's my closing thought. Be kinder than Jonah. Remember that God loves broken people. Let's pray. Lord, what a refreshing and weird truth to realize that we are all messed up pretty bad None of us here have just got it down so good that we can finally say, Whew, boy, I'm sure glad that sin thing is over with because now I can just live on in perfect holiness. We're just not there yet. But you are in us. You have called us to follow you. We thank you for that honor and privilege. And in the process of learning how to walk as you walk and learning how to pray as you prayed and learning how to love as you loved that other people can see you at work in us and through us. They might be able to think, my God, if you can work with that Ed guy, <laughs> I 
I guess I'm not too far from the kingdom myself. So draw us all to yourself, Lord. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.